Well, it's time to do my first video of the Aquarian Age, or the Age of Aquarius, and it's going to be a review of, instead of Smackdown, which would be a logical choice, I chose Nitro to make things fresh and interesting. Specifically, January 19th, 1998. And I don't know where... This one takes place in New Orleans, I think. Yeah, it's New Orleans. So it's Louisiana. Meaning that we're within Mimmel. Which is kind of cool if you think about it. If for anyone that knows U.S. geography. Now... Match number one is Eddie Guerrero versus Rick Martel. Right off the bat, since I never saw a Nitro before, I like how big and spacey it is as opposed to Raw at the time. And even now, Raw is a little narrow for me. Just the feel, architecture, the crowd. The crowd's more lively here. It just feels like when I hear a crowd making some big noise here, not only do I feel like I can hear it, it's not being absorbed by all these people, but it's also more lively, more spacious. There's more of an atmosphere to it, as opposed to the shallowness I and what? How would I describe it? the staleness of the raw crowd? Or the WWE crowd at the time. Because if you hear a pop from a baby face, it, it'd probably be like drowned out by the music and everyone's all compact in a dark arena. So, just some thoughts that are in my head right now. I say it a lot. And I say I say it a lot, a lot too, so. Yeah. Filler words up the ass. There's just, going into the actual match, the first two matches featured guys that I actually give a damn about, but ironically, I wasn't really paying attention to a lot of what was going on, since I was more mesmerized by the crowd than anything else. But you already know I got love for Eddie Guerrero. When I saw him in 2005, I hated him because of his heel gimmick, and I kind of regret that now because he is a badass. Repping that Latino heat shit. We get a promo from Hogan and Eric Bischoff. And it is weird seeing Bischoff that young since, again, when I saw Bischoff, Bischoff was in Raw as the general manager. So he was a little older, a little more distinctive. But I like this look of his. He looks like Jesse from Full House at the mo at that moment. Kind of a weird comparison, but that is kind of how he looks at the time. At that time. Hogan's all cocky and shit. I'm used to him being a Hulkamaniac. That kind of guy, your prayers, eat your vitamins thing. But here he's kind of, I'm feeling that cockiness and shit and that chicken shit heel stuff he's doing. And he still comes off looking like a strong badass, not like one of these heels that's automatically weak. Just because they're heel. We got Marty Gennetti versus Chris Benoit. And... Benoit is one of those motherfuckers who I think is very badass. I'm feeling the hairstyle he has now. Again, these guys change a lot over the course of a few years. The business definitely changes people, I guess. It ages them. Over the eras, over the years, over the administrations and shit. But, 
again, I wasn't paying attention to a lot of this match. I like both guys in terms of in-ring ability, and I can appreciate that. Next, we got Jerry Lynn versus the Cat, or Jerry Flynn, I don't know. I don't, I don't give a fuck. A lot of good in-ring work in this match. I mean, you got the kickboxing background, the mark. The martial arts background. I don't know if it was karate, jiu-jitsu, or taekwondo that that guy, the cat, specialized in. But, you know what? They had good in-ring chemistry, and that I can appreciate. So next we got Scott Hall doing a promo where he's talking some smack to living legend Larry Zabisco. And this is where... You gotta lo learn your history a little. I'm a bit of a Wikipedia scholar, and that's kind of where I get my information from. So, when this nigga, Scott Hall, is talking about Larry Sabisco and his career in the AWA, well, I have saw some matches from the AWA from, like, not from the internet, but from Time Warner Cable. They're giving off some, like, free... AWA matches, so I know a little bit about it, how that promotion worked, and I knew know a little bit about Larry Zabisco from the shit he Jericho was talking about him, and this like Nitro in the '90s is essentially the badass and dark version of the WWF in the '80s. You got all those cats from back then over here doing their shit. So in many ways, you gotta know a little about the 80s, a little bit about the 70s too, and I don't know my shit that well. Ooh. This eyebrow's looking mighty beefy and shit. Alright. Now, you got the Steiner Brothers versus Conan and Buff. This is one of those matches where apparently Scott's trying to go solo or something. Because he, he beats both of them single-handedly. And he pays no mind, even to the very end, to Rick Steiner. And he's doing all this shit with uh, Buff. Kind of, acting, kind of playing some games afterwards. Like, yeah, that was a good match. Posing with him and shit. And Rick's like, dude, what the fuck's the deal? And Steiner just walk, Scott just walks away. So that's that interesting shit where a tag team is going through some struggles. They're not getting along, and that's a little interesting. I mean, that kind of shit is very common to happen, but... I don't really like Scott Steiner. But... If this tag team is where, like, he really belonged at the time, then they should have kept him there. They shouldn't have put him on the world title hunt. I don't really like him that way. Hell, I fucking hated him back in when he was in the WWE feuding with Triple H. And I don't even like him in TNA. No, I don't. But that was an okay, it was a good tag team match because of its storytelling, how it's a tag team match, but it handles itself as a handicap match. And that, what does that mean? Well, you're going to have to tune in next week to find out what that means. That's what it mean back in 98. Now we got a Big Show segment. I call him Big Show even though he's the giant at this time because that's just the way I roll. I don't give a fuck that he was... Andre, Andre the Giant's kayfabe son. He's still the big show to me. But, there you have another, a third promo segment of the night. And, I think it was in its first hour yet. But, there you go. So, here you got show talking that good shit. He, st he still does this. He still raises his hands up signaling a choke slam, so some things never change. But then NWO comes and they try to bitch him out, but then what's his face? Randy Savage comes out. I feel sorry for some of the shit I said about Savage in 
2011. I feel like a scumbag based on... Well, I didn't say anything in a video, but I said some nasty stuff about him. I guess that shows ignorance. That's real ignorance, not political incorrectness, what I was saying about him. I, when he died, uh, my mom told me about him because she knows that I was like... I was just getting into wrestling again, and I, I was like, you know, I don't really care, but now I feel like an idiot for saying that. So a lot, a lot of stuff happened in that segment. Nitro is notorious for being chaotic around this time, and it gets more chaotic, You just you see. Now you have Mortis versus Booker T, and quite frankly, I'm Booker T used to be my favorite wrestler. He was my number one for many years, so... I actually, I was feeling this shit, and it's kind of weird seeing him without the dreads and shit, but whatever, he's looking real, he's looking badass, nice charismatic personality going up against Mortis, fuck yeah, and then after that, Booker T gets attacked by some nigga, and Rick Martel comes back, you see his face twice. And he basically kicks that nigga's ass out. Booker T's like, I owe you one. And Rick Martel's like, alright, you owe me one. So, give me a title match. Booker T's like, alright man, I'm a fighting champion. You got it. That's a way for... That's a way you can see, like, two baby faces interact in an interesting way. Put them like that, where... It's sort of like one guy makes the other guy look good and the other guy makes that guy look good. I, I think that's very cool. I think that's a seamless way of telling a story. Instead of if this was handled in WWE today, after they would throw in another segment afterwards where Rick Montel would like deck Booker T or Booker T would deck Rick Montel. Uh, now you got a Ric Flair segment, and here, here he is talking to Bret the Hitman Hart, and this is a match to see who is the very best in the world, which is something you see a lot more later on over the years. This match between two greats to see who is the very best, especially in 2012, you get to see that almost more than any other year. Although, like, Maybe 2002 to... Maybe 2001 or 2003. You you can say that that was there a lot, but nowhere near as concentrated as 2012. And it's a good segment between two people with Mike skills. I, I appreciate how Brett the Hitman Hart's Mike skills really develop over the years. And you already know that Ric Flair is the freshest guy all these guys, Hogan, Flair, uh, I think Jesse Ventura, like they, they all get their inspiration from, and this is a uh, superstar Billy Graham, so you can hear that in their voice, just the way they speak. They have that weird hippie-ish black guy tone in their voice. Anyway, I'm about to put this in part two, so if you all want to see the conclusion, you know where to get it.